On this episode, we will discuss what people call the most diabolical ever to be presented before a court or jury, and a senior investigator from the Indianapolis Police Department described as the most sadistic case he had ever investigated in the 35 years he served on the force. This episode will discuss child abuse, rape, sexual abuse and torture, so viewer discretion is advised. This is the murder of Sylvia Likens. Welcome to Enter the Dark. Hello and welcome to Enter the Dark. I am Jan from Film Daddy. With me as always is Les from Tales from the Hanging Man. How's it going, Les? It's all good, man. It's all good. Good, good, good. Right then, so today's case, as you heard from the intro there, it is bit of a dark and twisted one and um, when I first heard about it it really shocked me yeah so shall we just jump into it I think so not so much jump I think um, step lightly yes um, as we said before it we will be discussing child abuse rape sexual abuse and torture so viewer discretion is advised on this one Sylvia Likens was the third of five children born to carnival workers Lester Cecil Likens and his wife Elizabeth Francis Betty, as she liked to be called. She was born between the two sets of fraternal twins, Diana and Daniel, who were two years older than her, and Jenny and Benny, one year younger. Jenny and Benny. Why would you do that to your children? Jenny Likens suffered from polio, causing one of her legs to be weaker than the other. She was afflicted with a notable limp and had to wear a steel brace on one leg. Lester and Elizabeth's marriage was unstable. They often sold candy, beer and soda at carnival stands around Indiana throughout the summer, moving frequently and experiencing severe financial difficulties. The Lycan's son regularly helped their parents when they travelled, although due to concerns for their young daughter's safety and education, Lester and Elizabeth did not particularly like Sylvia and Jenny travelling with them in this employment. Both girls frequently resided with relatives, often their grandmother, so their schoolwork would not suffer while their parents and brothers travelled with the carnival. In her teenage years, Likens occasionally earned spending money by babysitting, running errands, or performing ironing chores for friends and neighbours, often giving her mother part of her earnings. Oh, it's nice of her, isn't it? Yeah, that's really nice. She was described as a friendly and confident, lively young girl with long, wavy, light brown hair extending below her shoulders, and was known as Kooky to her friends. Although exuberant, Likens always kept her mouth closed when smiling, due to having lost a front tooth in a collision with one of her brothers during a game. She was notably protective of her markedly more timid and insecure younger sister. On several occasions, the sisters would visit a local skating rink, with Jenny fastening a single roller skate to her strong foot and Sylvia holding her by the hand as the sisters skated around the rink. By June 1965, Sylvia and Jenny Likens resided with their parents in Indianapolis. On July the 3rd, their mother was arrested and subsequently jailed for shoplifting. Shortly thereafter, Lester Likens arranged for his daughters to board with Gertrude Banaszewski, the mother of two girls who the sisters had recently become acquainted while studying at Arsenal Technical High School, Paula and Stephanie Banaszewski, who were 17 and 15 years old. At the time of this boarding agreement, Gertrude assured Lester she would care for his daughters until his return as if they were her own which included John 12, Marie 11, Shirley 10, James 8, and a few months old son, Dennis Lee Wright Jr. Now, Gertrude Nadine Banaszewski was born the third of six children in Indianapolis, Indiana, to Molly Myrtle and Hugh Marcus Van Fossen Sr., both of whom were originally from Illinois and were of American and Dutch descent. Mm. Well, American and Dutch descent, what's wrong with that? Alright. <laughs> Dutch. It was filthy Dutch. On October the 5th, 1939, Banaszewski saw her 50-year-old father die from a sudden heart attack. Six years later, she dropped out of high school at age 16 to marry 18-year-old John Stephen Banaszewski, who was originally from Youngsville, Pennsylvania, and with whom she bore four children. Although John Banaszewski had a volatile temper and occasionally beat his wife, the two would remain together for ten years prior to their first divorce. Following her divorce, Banaszewski married a man named Edward Guthrie. The marriage lasted just three months before the couple divorced. 
Shortly thereafter, Banaszewski remarried her first husband, bearing him two more children. The couple divorced for a second time in 1963. No TV back then, was there? Oh well, no, there was. It was 1963. Yeah, and TV was everywhere. Some good TV, actually, as well. Um, the fuck? Maybe she just likes having kids. She's got married to her husband again. So, maybe she just likes it. Couldn't find... I mean, you change it up a bit, sure. Maybe he come back and said, I've changed, I'm a changed man. You maybe. Know? Weeks after her third divorce, Banaszewski began a relationship with a 22-year-old named Dennis Lee Wright, who also physically abused her. She had one child with Wright, Dennis Lee Wright Jr. Shortly after the birth of his son, Wright abandoned Banaszewski. By 1965, Banaszewski lived alone with her seven children. Although 36 years old and 5 foot 6 inches, she weighed only 100 pounds and was described as a haggard, underweight, asthmatic chain smoker suffering from depression due to the stress of three failed marriages, a failed relationship and a recent miscarriage. In addition to the sporadic checks she received from her first husband, a former Indianapolis policeman, which she primarily relied upon to financially support her children, Banaszewski occasionally performed odd jobs for neighbours and acquaintances, such as sewing or cleaning in order to earn money. Banaszewski resided in Indianapolis at 3850 East New York Street, where the monthly rent was $55. Shortly after the July 4th holiday, the sisters moved into 3850 East New York Street in order that their father and later their mother could travel to the East Coast with the carnival with the understanding that Gertrude would receive weekly boarding fees of $20 to care for their daughters until they returned to collect Sylvia and Jenny in November that year. During the initial weeks, Sylvia and Jenny resided at the Banaszewski household. The sisters were subjected to very little discipline or abuse. Lycans regularly sang along to pop records with Stephanie, and she willingly participated in housework at the Banaszewski residence. Both girls also regularly attended Sunday school with the Banaszewski children, Although Lester Likens had agreed to pay Gertrude Banaszewski $20 a week in exchange for the care of his daughter, these weekly payments gradually failed to arrive upon the prearranged dates. The payments were occasionally arriving one or two days late. In response, Gertrude began venting her frustration at this fact upon the sisters by beating them with their various instruments, such as a one-quarter inch thick paddle, making statements such as, Well, I took care of you two little bitches for a week for nothing. On one occasion in late August, both girls were beaten approximately 15 times on the back with the paddle after Paula accused the sisters of eating too much food at a church supper that all the household children had attended. So, it's taken quite a sinister turn. Yeah, and it seems so nice to begin with. Yeah. Quite idyllic. But yeah. it's like, as soon as the payments stop coming through, shit. But they were only like one or two days late as well. Yeah being like this with him. You'd think in, in any other normal circumstance that you'd just be like, oh, well, it was a day late last month. Probably the case. They are working at a carnival. Yeah. But it's going to be difficult. Like, they didn't have internet banking back then. No. But by mid-August of 1965, Gertrude Banaszewski had begun to focus her abuse almost exclusively upon Sylvia, with her primary motivation likely being jealously of her physical appearance. According to the trial testimony, this abuse was initially inflicted upon Sylvia after she and Jenny had returned to the Banaszewski residence from the Arsenal Technical High School and on weekends. This initial abuse included subjecting lichens to beatings and the refusal of sufficient food, which gradually led to Sylvia eating leftovers or spoiled food out of garbage cans. On one occasion, lichens was accused of stealing candy which she had actually purchased. On another occasion, she was subjected to humiliation when she admitted that she once had a boyfriend. Upon hearing this, Gertrude Banaszewski's oldest daughter, Paula, herself overweight, three months pregnant at the time, apparently jealous of Lycan's slender appearance, kit Lycan's in the genitals and accused her of being pregnant. On one occasion, as the family ate supper, Gertrude, Paula and a neighbourhood boy named Randy Gordon Lepper force-fed Sylvia a hot dog overloaded with condiments, including mustard and spices. Sylvia vomited as a result and was later forced to consume what she had regurgitated. Likens was later falsely accused of spreading rumours at Arsenal Technical High School that both Paul and Stephanie Banaszewski were prostitutes. This provoked Stephanie's boyfriend, 15-year-old Coy Hubbard, to physically attack Likens, while Stephanie simply watched and giggled. On another occasion, 
Paula beat Lycans around the face with such force that she broke her own wrist, having primarily focused her blows upon Lycans' teeth and eyes. Later, Paula used the cast on her wrist to further beat Lycans. Gertrude repeatedly falsely accused Sylvia of promiscuity and of engaging in prostitution, delivering misogynistic sermons to Sylvia regarding the filthiness of prostitution and of women in general. Gertrude would later force Jenny to strike her own sister, beating Jenny if she did not comply. Coy Hubbard and several of his classmates frequently visited the Banaszewski residence to both physically and verbally torment Lycans, often collaborating with the Banaszewski's children and Gertrude herself. With the active encouragement of Gertrude, these neighbourhood children routinely beat Lycans, sometimes using her as practice dummy in violent judo sessions, lacerating her body, burning her skin with lit cigarettes in excess of a hundred times, and severely injuring her genitals. To entertain Gertrude and her teenage accomplices, Lycans was forced at one point to strip naked in the family living room and insert an empty Coca-Cola bottle into her own vagina in their presence, with Gertrude stating to all present this act of humiliation being for Sylvia to prove to Jenny what kind of girl you are. What on... Gertrude Banaszewski eventually forbade Lycans from attending school after she confessed to having stolen a gym suit from the school after Gertrude had refused to purchase any clothing for her. For this act of theft, Gertrude whipped Lycans with a three-inch wide police belt. Gertrude then switched her conversation to the evils of premarital sex before repeatedly kicking Lycans in the genitals. As Stephanie rallied to Lycan's defence, shouting she didn't do anything. Gertrude then burned Lycan's fingertips with matches before whipping her. A few days later, Gertrude repeatedly whipped Jenny with the police belt after she reportedly sold a single tennis shoe from the school to wear on her strong foot. The Lycan sisters were fearful of notifying either family members or adults at their school of the increasing incidence of abuse and the neglect they were enduring as both were afraid that doing so would only worsen their predicament. Jenny in particular struggled against the urge to notify family members, as she herself had been threatened by Gertrude that she would be abused and tortured the same degree as her sister if she did so. Jenny was also subjected to bullying by girls in her neighbourhood, in addition to occasionally being ridiculed or beaten whenever she alluded to Sylvia's situation. In July and August, both Lester and Elizabeth Lycans would occasionally return to Indianapolis to visit their daughters whenever their travel schedule afforded them the opportunity. The last occasion Lester and Elizabeth visited their daughters was in late August. On this occasion, neither girl exhibited any visible signs of distress as to their mistreatment to their parents, likely because both were in the presence of Gertrude and her children. Almost immediately after Lester and Elizabeth had left the Banaszewski household on their final visit, Gertrude turned to face Lycans and stated, What are you going to do now, Sylvia? Now they're gone. On one occasion in September, the girls encountered their older sister, Diana Shoemaker, at their local park. Both Jenny and Sylvia informed Diana as to the abuse they were enduring at the hands of their caregiver on this occasion, adding that Sylvia was being specifically targeted for physical abuse, almost always for things that she had neither said nor done. Neither sister mentioned the actual address where they resided and initially... Diana believed their sisters must be exaggerating their claims regarding the scope of their mistreatment. Several weeks prior to this occasion, Sylvia and Jenny had encountered Diana in the same park when she was in the company of 11-year-old Marie Banaszewski and Sylvia had been given a sandwich to eat when she had mentioned to her sister she was hungry. Lycans remained silent about the matter, although Marie revealed this fact to her family in the late September. In response, Gertrude accused Lycans of engaging in gluttony before she and Paula choked and bludgeoned her. The pair then subjected Lycans to a scalding bath to cleanse her skin of sin, with Gertrude grabbing Lycans' hair and repeatedly banging her head against the bath to revive her when she fainted. Shortly after this incident, the father of a neighbourhood boy named Michael John Munro phoned the high school to anonymously report that a girl with open sores across her entire body was living at the Banaszewski household. As Lycans had not attended school for several days, a school nurse visited to investigate these claims. Although Gertrude claimed to the nurse that Lycans had run away from her home the previous week and that she was unaware of her actual whereabouts, adding that Lycans was out of control 
and that her open sores was a result of Lycan's refusal to maintain decent personal hygiene. Gertrude further exclaimed that Lycan's was a bad influence on both her own children and her sister. The school made no further investigations in relation to Lycan's welfare. The immediate neighbours of the Banaszewski family were a middle-aged couple named Raymond and Phyllis Vermillion. Both initially viewed Gertrude as an ideal caregiver for the Lycan sisters, and both had been visited the Banaszewski residence on two occasions when the girls had been under Gertrude's care. On both occasions, the Vermillions witnessed Paula physically abusing Lycans, who on both occasions had a black eye, and openly boasting about her mistreatment of the child to them. Upon their second visit to the Banaszewski household, both observed Lycans to appear extremely meek and in a somewhat zombified in nature. Nonetheless, the Vermillions never reported the Lycans' evident mistreatment to the authorities. Why? You can see him punching it, she's got a black eye. You go around again. She's got a black eye. She's in a zombified state, looking meek. Why not just say to the police, this is happening, I've seen this. Ugh. As awful as it may sound, though, I guess, with it being the 1960s, I mean, I don't know. Maybe that, that kind of thing, like the physical discipline of your children, was kind of expected and more tolerated. But it shouldn't be. It shouldn't. No. It's disgusting. However, if you would have said she was a communist. She's a communist, <laughs> so she gets all the beatings. No, I'm just thinking if you would have said, oh, she's a communist, they would have reported it. But there we go. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, good point. On or about October the 1st, Diana Shoemaker discovered that her sisters were temporarily residing at the Banaszewski residence. She visited the property to initiate regular contact. Although Gertrude Banaszewski refused Diana entrance to her property, stating that she had permission from their parents not to allow either girl to see her. She then ordered Diana off her property. Approximately two weeks later, Diana encountered Jenny by chance close to the 3850 East New York Street's address and inquired as to Lycan's welfare. To be brusquely informed, I can't tell you or I'll get in trouble. Due to the increase in frequency and brutality of the torture and mistreatment she was subjected to, Lycans gradually became incontinent. She was denied any access to the bathroom, being forced to wet herself. As a form of punishment for her incontinence, on October the 6th, Gertrude simply threw Lycans into the basement and tied her up. Here she was often kept naked, rarely fed and frequently deprived of water. Occasionally, she would be tied to a railing at the bottom of the basement stairs in a torture rack fashion, with her feet scarcely touching the ground. In the weeks prior to locking Lycans in the family basement, Gertrude had increasingly made the habit of abusing and tormenting the child something of a pastime. She would occasionally falsely claim to the children in her household that either she herself or one of them had been the recipient of direct insults from Lycans in the hope that this would go them into belittling or attacking her. On one occasion, Gertrude held a knife loft and challenged Lycans to fight me back, to which Lycans replied she did not know how to fight. In response, Gertrude inflicted a light scabble wound to Lycans' leg. Physical and mental torment such as this was occasionally ceased by Banaszewskis to watch their favourite television shows. Neighbourhood children were also occasionally charged five cents apiece to see the display of Lycans' body and to humiliate, beat, scold, burn and ultimately mutilate her. So that's kids from the local neighbourhood being invited in, charged five cents to mutilate a girl. Why? Mm. Why indeed? Ooh. Throughout the period of Lycan's captivity in the basement, Gertrude frequently, with the assistance of her children and their other friends, restrained Lycan's before placing her in a bathtub filled with scalding water before proceeding to rub salt into her wounds. In order to muffle Lycan's screams and pleas for mercy, her tormentors would regularly place a cloth gag in her mouth as they tortured her. On one occasion, Gertrude and her 12-year-old son, John Jr., rubbed urine and feces from Gertrude's one-year-old son's diaper into Lycan's mouth, before giving her a cup of half-filled with water and stating the water was all she would receive for the remainder of the day. On October 22nd, John Banaszewski Jr., tormented Lycans by offering to allow her to eat a bowl of soup with her fingers, then quickly taking away the bowl when Lycans, by this stage suffering from extreme malnourishment, attempted to eat the food. 
Gertrude Banaszewski eventually allowed Lykins to sleep upstairs, on the condition that she learn not to wet herself. That night, Sylvia whispered to Jenny to secretly give her a glass of water before falling asleep. The following morning, Gertrude discovered that Lykins had urinated herself, and as a punishment, Lykins was forced to masturbate with an empty glass Coca-Cola bottle in the presence of the Banaszewski children before Gertrude ordered her to enter the basement. Shortly thereafter, Gertrude shouted for Lykins to return to the kitchen, then ordered her to strip naked before proclaiming to her, You have branded my daughters, now I am going to brand you. She began carving the words, I am a prostitute and proud of it, onto Lykins abdomen with a heated needle. When Gertrude was unable to finish the branding, she instructed one of the neighbourhood's children present, 14-year-old Richard Hobbs, to finish etching the words into Lycan's flesh as she took Jenny to a nearby grocery store. And what Hobbs would later insist were short, light etchings. He continued to brand the text into Lycan's abdomen as she clenched her teeth and moaned. Both Hobbs and 10-year-old Shirley Banaszewski then led Lycan's into the basement where each proceeded to use an anchor bolt in an attempt to burn the letter S beneath Lycan's left breast. Although they applied one section of the loop backwards and this deep burn scar would resemble the numeral three, Gertrude later taunted Lycan's by claiming she would never be able to manage due to the words carved on her stomach, stating, Sylvia, what are you going to do now? You can't get married now. What are you going to do now? Weeping, Lycans replied, I guess there's nothing I can do. She was then carried back to the basement by Coy Hubbard. Later that day, Lycans was forced to display the carving to the neighbourhood children, with Gertrude claiming she received the inscription at a sex party. That night, Sylvia confided to her sister, Jenny, I know you don't want me to die, but I'm going to die. I can tell it. The following day, Gertrude Banaszewski woke Lycans, then forced her to write a letter as she dictated the contents which were intended to mislead her parents into believing their daughter had run away from the Banaszewski residence. The content of this letter was intended to frame a group of anonymous local boys for extensively abusing and mutilating Lycans after she had initially agreed to engage in sexual relations with them before they inflicted the extreme abuse and torture upon her body. After Lycans had written this letter, Gertrude finished formulating her plan to have John Jr. and Jenny blindfold Sylvia and take her to a nearby wooded area known as Jimmy's Forest and simply leave her there to die. On October 25th, Lycans is tempted to escape from the basement after overhearing conversation pertaining to Gertrude Banaszewski's plan to simply abandon her to die. She attempted to flee to the front door, although due to her extensive injuries and general weakness, Gertrude caught her before she could escape the property. Lycans was then given toast to eat, but was unable to consume the food due to her extreme state of dehydration. Gertrude forced the toast into her mouth before (coughs) repeatedly striking her face with a curtain rod until sections of the instrument were bent into right angles. Coy Hubbard then took the curtain rod from Gertrude and struck Lycans one further time, rendering her unconscious. She was then dragged into the basement. That evening, Lycans desperately attempted to alert neighbours by screaming for help and hitting the walls of the basement with a spade. One immediate neighbour of the Banaszewskis would later inform police she had heard the desperate commotion that she had identified the sources emanating from the basement. Well, why didn't she do anything? But as soon as that noise had suddenly ceased at approximately 3am, she decided not to inform the police about the disturbance. By the morning of the October 26, Lycans was unable to either speak intelligibly or correctly coordinate the movement of her limbs. Gertrude did move Lycans back into the kitchen and, having propped her back against the wall, attempted to feed her a donut and a glass of milk. Although she threw Lycans to the floor in frustration when she was unable to correctly move the glass of milk to her lips, she was then returned to the basement. Shortly thereafter, Lycans became delirious, repeatedly moaning and mumbling. Paula asked her to recite the alphabet. Lycans was unable to recite anything beyond the first four letters or to raise herself off the ground. In response, Paula verbally threatened her to stand up or she would herself inflict a long jump on her soon. Gertrude then ordered Lycans, who had defecated, to clean herself. That afternoon, several of Lycans' other tormentors gathered in the basement. Lycans moved her arms in an apparent attempt to point at the faces of the tormentors she could recognise, making statements such as, You're Ricky, and You're Gertie, before Gertrude tersely shouted, Shut up, you know who I am. 
Minutes later, Likens unsuccessfully attempted to bite into a rotten pear she had been given to eat, stating she could feel the looseness in her teeth. Upon hearing this, Jenny replied, Don't you remember, Sylvia? Your front tooth was knocked out when you were seven. Jenny then left Sylvia in the basement to perform gardening chores for neighbours in the hope of earning spending money. In an attempt to wash Likens, a laughing John Banaszewski Jr., sprayed her with a garden hose brought into the house that afternoon by Randy Leppard at Gertrude's request. Likens again dis desperately attempted to exit the basement but collapsed before she could reach the stairs. In response to this effort, Gertrude stamped upon Likens' head before standing and staring at her for several moments. Stephanie then decided to give Likens a warm soapy bath, although Likens ceased breathing before she could be carried out of the basement. She was 16 years old. When Stephanie realised that Likens was not breathing, she attempted to apply mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation as Gertrude repeatedly shouted her belief to the children and teenagers present in the house that Likens was simply faking her death. Shortly after 5.30pm, Richard Hobbs returned to the Banaszewski residence and immediately proceeded to the basement. He slipped on the wet basement stairs and heavily fell onto the floor. To be confronted by the sight of Stephanie crying and cuddling Lycan's emaciated and lacerated body. Now Gertrude Banaszewski finally accepted her efforts to revive Lycan's by bathing her and her own efforts of twice striking Lycan's face with a book to revive her were unsuccessful. She instructed Richard Hobbs to call the police from a nearby payphone. When the police arrived at her address at approximately 6.30pm, Gertrude led the officers to Lycan's emaciated, extensively bludgeoned and mutilated body lying upon a soiled mattress in one of the bedrooms. Before handing them the letter, she had forced Lycan's to previously write to her dictation, also claiming that she had been doctoring the child for an hour or more prior to the death. Having applied rubbing alcohol to Lycan's wounds and a futile attempt at first aid before she died. She added that Lycan's had earlier run away from her home with several teenage boys before returning to her house early that afternoon, bare breasted and clutching the note. Clutching a Bible, Paula Banaszewski had been stated to all present in the household that Lycan's death was meant to happen, then glanced in Jenny's direction and calmly stated, If you want to live with us, Jenny, we'll treat you like our own sister. As previously instructed by Gertrude, Jenny Likens recited the rehearsed version of the events leading to Likens' death shortly after 5.30pm that afternoon to the police before whispering to the officers, you get me out of here and I'll tell you everything. The formal statement provided by Jenny Likens prompted officers to arrest Gertrude, Paula, Stephanie and John Banaszewski Jr. on suspicion of Likens' murder within hours of the discovery of the body the same day. Coy Hubbard and Richard Hobbs were also arrested and charged with the same offences. The three eldest Banaszewski children, plus Coy Hubbard, were placed in the custody of a nearby juvenile detention centre. The younger Banaszewski children and Richard Hobbs were detained at the Indianapolis Children's Guardian's home. All were held without bail pending trial. Initially, Gertrude denied any involvement in Lycan's death, although by October 27 she had confessed to having known the kids particularly her daughter, Paula, and Coy Hubbard, had physically and emotionally abused Likens. Gertrude further admitted to having forced the girl to sleep in the basement on approximately three occasions when she had wet the bed. She became evasive when one officer stated the likely reasons Likens had become incontinent were her mental distress and injury to her kidneys. Five other neighbourhood children who had participated in the abuse, Michael Munro, Randy Lepper, Darlene McGuire, Judy Duke, and Anna Sisko had also been arrested by October 29th. All were charged with causing injury to a person and each was subsequently released into the custody of their parents under subpoena to appear as witnesses at the upcoming trial. The autopsy of Lycan's body revealed that she had suffered in excess of 150 separate wounds across her entire body, in addition to being extremely emaciated at the time of her death. The wounds themselves were varied in location, nature, severity and the actual stage of healing. Her injuries included burns, severe bruising, and extensive muscle and nerve damage. Her vaginal cavity was almost swollen shut, although an examination of her canal determined that her hymen was still intact, proving Lycans was still a virgin, and thus discrediting Gertrude's assertions Lycans had been three months pregnant, a prostitute, and promiscuous. Moreover, all of Lycans' fingernails were broken backwards, 
most of the external layers of the skin upon the child's face, breast and necks and right knee had peeled or receded in the death throes like and said evidently bitten through her lips, partially severing sections of them from her face. The official cause of Lycan's death was listed by the coroner as subdural hematoma due to her receiving a severe blow to her right temple. Both the shock she had primarily suffered due to the severe and prolonged damage inflicted to her skin and subcutaneous tissues, plus the severe malnutrition were listed as contributory factors to her death. Rigor mortis had fully developed at the time of the discovery of her body, indicating she may have been deceased for up to eight hours before she was found. Although Dr. Kebble did note Lycans had been recently bathed, possibly after death, and that this act could have hastened the loss of body temperature, and thus speeding the onset of rigor mortis. On December 30th, 1965, the Marion County Grand Jury returned a first-degree murder in diamonds against Gertrude Banaszewski and two of her three oldest children, Paula and John Banaszewski Jr. Also indicted were Richard Hobbs and Coy Hubbard, all were charged with having repeatedly struck, beaten, kicked, and otherwise inflicting a culmination of fatal injuries to Sylvia Likens, with premeditated malice. At a formal pre-trial hearing on March 16, 1966, several psychiatrists testified for Judge Saul Isaac Rabb as to their conclusions regarding psychiatric evaluations they had conducted upon the three individuals. These experts testified that all three were mentally competent to stand trial. The trial of Gertrude Banaszewski, her children Paula and John, Richard Hobbs and Coy Hubbard began on April 18, 1966. On May 2nd and 3rd, Jenny Likens testified that all five defendants, stating that each had repeatedly and extensively, both physically and emotionally, abused her sister, adding that Likens had done nothing to provoke the assaults, and that there had been no truth in either rumours she had been falsely accused of spreading or the slurs each had made against Likens' character. During her testimony, Jenny stated the abuse of her sister, and to much lesser degree, herself, endured began approximately two weeks after they had begun to live in the Banaszewski household, and that as the abuse her sister was forced to endure escalated, Lycans had occasionally been unable to produce tears due to the acute state of her dehydration. Sections of Jenny Lycans' testimony were later corroborated by that of Randy Lepper, who stated he had once witnessed Lycans crying, but she shed no actual tears. Lepper then visibly smirked, he confessed to having beaten Lycans anywhere between 10 and 40 separate instances. Fucking piece of shit. Yeah. The trial of the five defendants lasted 17 days before the jury retired to consider its verdict. On May 19th, after deliberating for eight hours, the panel of eight men and four women found Gertrude Banaszewski guilty of first degree murder, recommending a sentence of life imprisonment. Paula Banaszewski was found guilty of second-degree murder, and Hobbs, Hubbard and John Banaszewski Jr. were found guilty of manslaughter. Upon hearing Judge Rabb pronounce the verdicts, Gertrude and her children burst into tears and attempted to console each other as Hobbs and Hubbard remained impassive. On May 25th, Gertrude was formally sentenced to life imprisonment, and Paula would plead guilty to voluntary manslaughter and received a sentence between 2 and 20 years. Despite twice unsuccessfully having attempted to escape from prison in 1971, she was released in December 1972. The same day, Richard Hobbs and Coy Hubbard and John Banaszewski Jr. each received sentences of 2 to 21 years to be served in the Indiana Reformatory. Over the course of the following 14 years, Gertrude Banaszewski became known as a model prisoner at the Indiana Women's Prison, she worked in the prison sewing shop and was known as somewhat of a den mother to younger female inmates. Becoming known to some within the prison of the nickname Mom, by the time of Gertrude's ultimate parole in 1985, she had changed her name to Nadine Van Fossen, a combination of her middle name and maiden name, and described herself as a devout Christian. News of her Banaszewski's impending parole created uproar throughout Indiana. Jenny Likens and other immediate family members of the Likens vehemently protested against any prospect of her relief. The members of two anti-crime groups also travelled into Indiana to oppose Banaszewski's potential parole and to publicly support the Likens family. Members of both groups initiated a sidewalk picket campaign. Over the course of two months, these groups collected over 40,000 signatures from citizens of Indiana, including signatures obtained from outraged citizens too young to contemporarily recollect the case. All signatures gathered demanded that Gertrude Banaszewski remain incarcerated for the rest of her life. Within her parole hearing, 
Ranazuski stated her wish that Lycan's death could be undone, although she minimised her responsibility for any actions. I'm not sure what role I had, because I was on drugs. I never really knew her. I take the full responsibility for whatever happened to Sylvia. Taking Gertrude's good conduct in prison into account, the parole board marginally voted in favour of granting her parole. She was released from prison on December the 4th. She accepted full responsibility for the ultimate architects in Lycan's prolonged torment or ultimate death, insisting she was unable to precisely recall any of her actions in the months of Lycan's prolonged and increasing abuse and torment within her home. She blamed her actions upon the medication she'd been prescribed to treat her asthma. She lived in relative obscurity in Laurel, Iowa, until her death of lung cancer on June 16th, 1990, at the age of 61. Following her parole in 1972, Paula Banaszewski assumed a new identity. She worked as an aide to a school counsellor for 14 years. She worked in a school? A school? At the Iowa Beam and Comrade Liscombe Union Witten School District, having changed her name to Paula Pace and having concealed the truth regarding her criminal history to the district when applying for the position. She was fired in 2012 when the school discovered her true identity. She reportedly lives in a small town in Iowa. Stephanie Banaszewski assumed a new name and became a school teacher. She later married and has several children. Following the arrest of her mother, the Marion County Police of Public Welfare placed Marie Shirley and James Banaszewski in the care of separate foster families. Marie Shelton died of natural causes on June 8, 2017 at the age of 62. Dennis Lee Wright Jr. Was, was later adopted. His adopted mother named him Denny Lee White. He died on February the 5th, 2012, aged 47. Richard Hobbs, Coy Hubbard and John Banaszewski each served less than two years in the Indiana Reformatory before being granted parole. Richard Hobbs died of lung cancer on 1972 at the age of 21, four years after his release. In the years between his release from the Indiana Reformatory and his death, he is known to have suffered at least one nervous breakdown. Following his 1968 release, Coy Hobbard remained in Indiana and never attempted to change his name. Throughout his adult life, he was repeatedly in prison for various criminal offences. John Banaszewski Jr. lived in relative obscurity under an alias John Blake. He became a lay minister, frequently hosting counselling sessions to the children of divorced parents. What the goodness? Several decades after his release, John Banaszewski Jr. issued a statement in which he acknowledged the fact that he and his co-defendants should have been sentenced to a more severe term of punishment. No shit. Adding that young criminals are not beyond, beyond rehabilitation and describing how he had become a decent and productive citizen. He died of diabetes on May 19, 2005 at the age 52. Prior to his death, he had also occasionally spoken publicly about his past readily admitting he enjoyed the attention the Lycan's murder brought upon him. Oh, for good. Oh. Lepper, that little prick who visibly smirked as he testified, died at the age of 56 in 2010. What? It doesn't say. Hopefully it was torture. Jenny Lycan's later remarried an Indianapolis native named Leonard Reese Wade. The couple had two children. She died of a heart attack on June 23rd, 2004, at the age of 54. At the time of her death, Jenny resided in Beech Grove, Indiana. Elizabeth and Lester Lycans died in 1998 and 2013, respectively. In the years prior to her own death, Sylvia Lycans Wade repeatedly emphasised no blame should be place, placed upon either of their parents for placing her and Sylvia in the care of Gertrude Banaszewski stating all her parents had done was trust Gertrude's promise to actually care for them till their return to Indiana with the travelling carnival. As I said before, that was quite horrific, and there's not much we can say you can say about that, is there? There's quite probably... I think that's like one of the worst... It's one of the worst things I've ever heard about of the, you know, treatment of not only a child, but just of a human being, the constant mental and physical torture it wasn't like on a couple of occasions and then it got too far and she died this was over months it's also disturbing i think in the in the sense that you've got the bandwagon jumping of the um neighborhood kids for us it's the worst case that we've dealt with so far and i've heard of yeah but please guys 
um, let us know in the comments. And as I said, if you are affected by any of these things, please reach out to people because people are there to help you. I'm Jan from Film Daddy. This is Les from Tales from the Hangman. We'll catch you next time.